Okay. So let's uh, let's get started with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter into this Holy Week, we give you thanks, praise, honor, and glory for the work that you have accomplished in Jesus. That for some reason you love us to the degree that you would send your son willingly into a den of violent, sinful people to suffer our fate in our hands. Help our worship this week, our meditations in our minds, and among our communities be well-pleasing in your sight as we seek to remember and honor the gift of salvation won in Jesus. Be with us today, this morning, as we are gathered around your word to learn and grow as your disciples. Help us to be spurred by this knowledge to follow where you go and to serve you, as you said today in our gospel reading, that those who serve you are honored by your Father. May we be found among those people. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I know it was a really grueling biblical reading assignment to read the book of Jude. We only had seven days. I know it's never been done before. Um, I know. You, know you, get, you get one verse and you're up here. So it's your out of breath. Um, okay, so uh, the half sheet, we'll start with the half sheet handout. That's the book of Jude. Uh, it's our biblical literacy, literacy reading for today. Um, and we're going to keep it pretty short and simple uh, because this isn't a Bible study about Jude. Uh, it's a Bible study about baptism. But here we go. All right. So in the vast amount of words and verses in Jude, what did you pick up that it's primarily about? Stay focused, and then um, it's about um, so that you don't get um, trapped by false prophets. Yeah, right. It's a warning and a caution against false teachers. All right. So this is believed to be written later, and it, uh, later than some of the other letters in the New Testament, because at this point in time, there were false teachers that were sort of seeping into the Christian communities that had been established, and so he's primarily writing as a warning against them. It's very similar to. Second Peter chapter 3 has a similar message as well. Um, so that's the primary focus of the book of Jude is a warning against false teachers. Okay? Now, what, what's so particularly dangerous, dangerous about false teachers? Yeah, Janine. Well, if there's an enemy outside the body, it's easier to deal with them. Yeah. Because they're not false teachers are the enemy within the body, and it's a lot, um, it's a lot harder to identify, and then it's just also emotionally a lot harder to push against yeah. somebody on the inside. Right. And not only that, they're not just on the inside. What are they doing on the inside? They're and are they, so the, the warning for the teachers from Jesus was he says, not all of you are called to teach, right? And what was the reason he gave? Yeah. You're held to a greater account, right? In fact, one of the greater accounts that the teachers described as is if you cause even one of these little ones to fall away from me, it would be better for you if what? I don't know if you ever seen a millstone. The millstone is wrapped around your neck, and you're in the you're in the ocean. There's only one result. Okay? Um, so doesn't doesn't turn out well for those who mislead others away from Jesus. Okay? So false teachers are particularly dangerous not only because they're, as Janine pointed out, they're inside the body. They're not an easily identifiable outside enemy. Um, so there's a lot of messiness and emotions involved in that because you're in some ways usually attached to those people, right? But also that from their position, their influence, which is meant to be a greater influence used for good, is now a greater influence used for evil, right? Um, so the, the good example would be is if I, I'm the teacher here in this setting, imagine if I, the person holding this position, is the false teacher. Look at how many people I'm talking to right now and teaching about things. And many of you have, you know, you have an implicit trust in the person <laughs> occupying this place. Right? Uh, because, you know, they're the expert. They went to school. They learned the stuff. So 
what is really, really important and what does he encourage in Jude that you measure what you hear against? Scripture, right? So the pastor is not the rule and norm of the Christian life. What's the rule and norm of the Christian life? The word of God, right? And, and Paul says this in other places as well, right? That like, if what I'm saying to you is not from God, then I'm a false teacher, right? It has nothing to do with who is occupying the position, but the thing which they're attributing to, okay? So the second question, there's a couple words in there maybe you've never heard, homologumina and antilogomena. And we're not gonna get too into the weeds about this because there's a lot that goes into this. Um, so I just wanna give you a basic introduction. It's actually related to what we just talked about. It's where does the authority of scripture lie, okay? So the books of scripture that are agreed upon unanimously by pretty much every Christian group and person in history are called the homilagumina, right? Yeah. So everybody is of same mind. That's where the homo, the homo and homilagumina comes from, right? They're all of the same mind. And then there's a set of scripture, uh, books in the scriptures that are called antilagumina because they've been disputed throughout time from different groups. Jude is an anti legomena book. So for us, that doesn't mean it's not the word of God, but that as the word of God is interpreted through the books of unanimous agreement. Okay? Yeah. Like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot to this topic. Um, so if you want to know more, you can talk to me a little bit afterwards. That's like a whole other Bible study. And the reason I'm, I'm not I'm not dodging your question, the reason I don't want to get into that is if you get into a topic like this without going through the whole thing, it can actually cause people's understanding of scriptures to be harmed, and I don't want to cause that. So uh, is that that needs a lot more time than I've got to give this one. Okay. Um, so one moment, Pastor. Yeah. So Jude is considered is canonical. It is canonical, yes. So both of those categories are canonical. They're both parts of scripture. They're both meant to be read as words of God. Um, but one is interpreted in light of the other. Right? So Paul says something numerous times in his letters, which are agreed upon by everyone, which we believe is not just a, a democratic experiment, but actually a process guided by the Holy Spirit through the church. Then we interpret if there's some, like, so just... The one example I'll give you is in James. James is part of the anti okay, um, because it's been a disputed book at different times and different places. Luther famously didn't really like James at the beginning of his, his career as a theologian. Okay? And he didn't like James because he believed that James was speaking something contradictory to Paul. Right? Faith without works is death. And so what ends up happening now, because both those are canonical scripture, is that we interpret what James says in light of what Paul says. So if what Paul says is true, then faith that works is dead. It's not saying that works create faith, but that works are a natural resulting, they're the fruits of faith. Okay. So that's, that's just sort of a basic example of that. Now, the reason I bring this up is similarly to what we said before, I want to kind of get down to square one here. What is it that saves you? Grace through faith. Grace through faith in what? In Jesus, right? So where does the Bible play into that? Justify the law. In what way? All through, all through scripture, things are said that, you know, make make that true that, that we were saved by God's grace, not by anything we did. By bearing witness about what? For who? For who? Christ. Christ, right? Okay. So that means that as Christians, our faith is not in the Bible. Our faith is in Christ. Because he because he wrote it through the Holy Spirit. Yes. So the, the foundation of our faith is not the, the scriptures, but what the scriptures we believe bear faithful witness to. And that seems like a splitting of hairs, but it's actually a really important distinction because then when you have these categories like Homo Lagumina and Antilopoma. It doesn't then invalidate your faith because your faith isn't in the particular words written on the page, 
but in their faithful witnessing about the object of your faith, which is Christ. Okay. All right. That's all we're going to do on that. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to baptism. But uh, if you do have questions about that, or if what I just shared with you caused some confusion for you, please see me afterwards. Um, I do plan probably on addressing that uh, in greater detail. If you want to learn a little bit more about the dynamic there, that actually, even though it was a year ago, that was the part of the beginning of this class, this Lutheranism 101 class. I talked about the authority of Scripture and the working of the Holy Spirit through the Word, and it covers some of that stuff. So if you want to go back on our YouTube channel, those, those videos are posted there, and you can watch those if you want to refresh yourself. Okay. Now we're hopping over to baptism. Open up your Bibles to John chapter 3. Now we're going to read verses 1 through 15. Somebody there want to take that out? Sure. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All right. So what is Jesus indicating is happening in baptism as he's teaching Nicodemus here? In life. Yeah, being born again, right? Born into a new life. What happens when you're born? You are now alive, right? Uh, and so this is a new life that you're being born into. Now, he also directly addresses here the confusion of reason with faith. Because what is Nicodemus's response to Jesus saying, one must be born again? Yeah, he's like, how does that work? You can't, as an adult, go back into your mother's womb. Right? Uh, so what are you talking about? Uh, and then Jesus, of course, says water and the spirit, which we now know to be a reference to baptism. Right? Um, and so the work of baptism, I just taught this in the seventh and eighth grade confirmation class. One of my favorite titles for the job of the office of the Holy Ministry is that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. I like fantasy books. <laughs> steward, I'm a steward, the mysteries of God, right? Uh, what does that mean? That means that baptism is not something I can logically, reasonably explain to you how it works, right? So I can't conduct an experiment and say, oh, if this amount of water touches your head, when the words of God are spoken with this cadence, that's what does it, right? That's not, that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about a mystery work of God. What was Nicodemus trying to turn it into? He was trying to turn it into a work of whom? Man. Man, right? How is it that we could do this? That doesn't make any sense. Well, if somebody's an adult, how can they be born again, right? And so Jesus says that you are blind to these things. He's trying to 
uh, help him broaden his understanding of what God is doing. Right. And just as a textual note, anytime you see Jesus say, truly, truly, I say to you, that's sort of like, hey, 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 wake up, wake up. I'm about to say something important. Okay. He's emphasizing what he's about to say. Okay, any questions on that? Before we move on. Yeah, Kurt. Um, the wind blowing and uh, that was part of the reception. Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So in Hebrew, the, the word for wind is also the word for spirit. It's ruach. And so when uh, Jesus breathed the breath of life into man, he, he breathed the spirit into man. Um, and so what Jesus is saying here is he's using the wind as an example of one of those things that you can neither control nor fully grasp. And that's what he's saying is happening when you're born again. It's of that same type, right? Uh, like trying to grasp the Holy Spirit. So good question. Any others? All right. Question number two uh, from three. Question three seventeen. It's on page two ninety nine in your catechism. Is a Christian's faith in baptism or Jesus? We've had a couple of questions over the last few weeks about this. And before you look, what might your answer be? What? Okay, we were we would be tempted to say Jesus, right? Because of course faith in Jesus is what saves us, right? What does our catechism say under that question there? What's the first thing it says? This is a false alternative. Because essentially, let me translate this for you. Is your faith in Jesus or Jesus? That's what you're asking when you ask the question, is your faith in baptism or Jesus? Because baptism is. It's Jesus. Um, and so I found that to be a really helpful question for us to ponder because we've had a couple questions about that. And it seems to be our human tendency to want to say, yeah, but I can think of a hypothetical example where baptism is unnecessary. And the response from the scriptures is like, why would you do that? <laughs> Those things are going to come up regardless of whether or not you're thinking. There's no point in advocating for some sort of situation where baptism is unnecessary. But that isn't even really what's at stake there, right? What you're, what you're talking about is there are situations where baptism is not available, not that it's unnecessary. Right? And so the faith in Christ is, is the right answer. Yeah. Jim. I don't think our faith is in baptism. I think our faith comes from baptism because all our faith is Yeah. I mean, that, that, essentially, that's what we're saying, right? Because who's creating the faith in baptism? The Holy Spirit. Who sent you the Holy Spirit? Jesus did, right? And so this question is, is a Christian's faith in Jesus or Jesus? Because baptism doesn't work without Jesus. It's a command of Jesus. It's his instituted work of the church, right? So if somebody tries to direct a conversation, if you're having, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody about baptism, they're like, well, yeah, but what happens if somebody dies and they're not able to be baptized? Say, so, well, we can get to that in a second, but that doesn't really have anything to do with the place of baptism. Because right? um, that's usually used to argue. Um, the motivation behind a lot of that is usually to argue away from the necessity of church in general. The things given to the church, well, they're not really necessary. God is everywhere. God is love. And we can do all this stuff without those particular things. The only problem is the same God that you're saying is everywhere in his love and, and doesn't judge people, uh, in his own word, says quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. He gave you these specific things by your, for your benefit, right? And so it really is only a form of like a spiritual hard-heartedness that really pushes against that idea. Because right? if you think about it, what, what is your goal if you're trying to discourage baptism? Yeah. Yeah, and who are you aligning yourself against? Jesus, right? He, he set it up and made it the thing that it is, and then he commanded you to do it as the church. And so there really is no purpose in, in, in pushing against that. Um, okay. And I, I just really like the phrase when, when because Jesus talks about this and when it pertains particularly to the Sabbath. He said that, that uh, man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. Baptism is the same. Right? You weren't made for baptism, so baptism is not something that's going to crush you. It was made for you, to serve you. 
Right? That's why Jesus gave it to the church, to serve the church. Does that make sense? So let's, let's read this paragraph here. This is a false alternative. Baptism and Jesus cannot be separated. The Christian's faith is in Jesus' hand in baptism, for Jesus has put his word of promise in the water. Faith takes hold of Christ where he has promised to be for us, right? Our means of grace um, in theology. To trust in baptism is to trust in Christ, who saves us through the washing he has joined to his word. As Luther explains it, it is certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water that does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God for one. Right? Um, and then 1 Peter 3.21 is a scripture reference here. Baptism, which corresponds to this, Noah's flood, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the time of the Reformation, there were some disagreements about the nature of baptism and what it was and why it was necessary and when it should be done. And so there was a lot of clarifying being done by Luther about the role of baptism. Um, so there were the Anabaptists, uh, which would, would have fallen into the group of people who believed in rebaptizing, right? Because, well, it's a work of your, it's your outward profession of faith. Didn't seem to take because I saw you gambling the other day and cheating on your wife. And so you need to get rebaptized because the first one didn't, didn't hold, right? And we disagree with that on what ground? It ain't something we do, right? Uh, so our faithfulness does not validate our baptism, right? Whose faithfulness validates our baptism? Jesus' faithfulness, right? And at the end of our confession today, what did I say? I said, for he is faithful, he will surely do it. Go in peace. So the source of your peace there in the absolution pronounced through the office of the pastor, the source of your peace in your baptism is in the faithfulness of Jesus. It is in the faithfulness of all right. Any other questions about that? Before we do? Okay, turn to page 302 in your catechism if you have them. If not, it's in that little box in your handout. We're going to read the fourth part of baptism. What does baptism indicate? All right, what does such baptizing with water indicate? Let's read together. It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance. We drown and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is it written? St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Okay, so you remember from our gospel reading today the imagery of the seed. <coughs> in baptism, we follow that same path. Right? We go into the earth, we die, and fruit is born from that. So to speak, right? For Christ, his death bears the many fruit that is the faith of all those who believe in him. For us, our death and baptism, and the, the fruit that is born from that is the works of righteousness with, which Christ has prepared beforehand for us to walk in. And so this week, as we go through Holy Week, how are you united to the work that Christ does Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? In your baptism. That's why... All of the worship services we do here begin with what we call the invocation, because what is the invocation supposed to remind you of? Your baptism. It reminds you of the name by which you are baptized. It reminds you of why the gathering of people around you is, in fact, the body of Christ. Okay? And that's coincidentally, you know, it's up to you to do it if you want. If it's helpful, do it. If it's not, don't. But that's why I make the sign of the cross. That's a remembrance of my baptism. I know some people here do that, some people don't. Totally okay. But that's why we do that, in, in case you were wondering. And it's not a Catholic thing. It's just a thing that somebody does to remember their baptism. Okay. All right, so 
It's important for us to break this down. So looking at the first paragraph there, what does such baptizing water indicate? What are some key words that kind of give us a sense of what Luther is explaining to us here? Old Adam. Okay, so there's old Adam and new Adam. When he says old Adam, is he just referring to anybody named Adam over the age of 75? <laughs> what is old Adam? So I'm, I'm not quite an old Adam yet. Got a little ways to go. Right. What does old Adam refer to? Sin. Sin, right? Um, does it refer to sin as a concept? Original. original sin. And original sin is found where? In our flesh. In our flesh, right? So the old Adam is the representation, representational phrase for the old you, right? Because what's happening in baptism, what did we just learn? Well, something has to happen before the new flesh comes. What happened? The old flesh is getting killed, right? Drowned and died is what Luther said, using the image of the waters of baptism, right? So the old Adam is being washed away by Jesus, killed and cast out. That's what he was talking about, by the way. In the gospel reading, he said, whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life in this world will keep it for eternity. In baptism, you lose your life in this world. And you get a new one. All right, what else? What are the key spots in there? Brown, all right. Why are we focusing on that? Uh, because it's the washing away of who we are to be cleansed into who we become. Okay, and it is also a reminder of the very real judgment of God which we are under until this happens. It's not as if the justice of God, He was just sort of like, you know what. If I take this role seriously, nobody will make it. So I'm just going to get rid of the justice part of things for now. I'll suspend it and let you in. That's not what he did, right? Because what is about to happen this week? What's the big thing going on in Jerusalem? The crucifixion, right? The very real death of the only innocent human who ever lived. Because God's just wrath against sin must receive its due. Okay. Yeah, it is. Daily contrition and repentance. Why do you think it's important? But sometimes life just rolls day to day kind of slates go along with it. You have to think about how we can go along. Yeah, yeah. And how is that important for baptism? What would this possibly guard you against thinking about baptism? Saved, always saved. Yeah, once saved, always saved, right? Our evangelical friends. That the one and done deal. How many of you guys have memory of your baptism? <laughs> uh oh, we're in trouble. Right? And, and so, what, is, what Luther is saying here is that once you're baptized, in a certain sense, your justification is done, but what you've been called to in Christ is just the beginning. Because until Christ returns and renews all of creation, what are you still battling against? Sin. Sin. And what does Luther call that? The old, the old Adam. So there's still that part of you that wants to do what the world wants, that wants to cling to this life. Right? And so what baptism does is it gives you a stronghold against that old Adam. Because the old Adam's tactics are vicious and cruel. He says to follow after these things because, well, you're a shameful and unworthy person. Follow after these things. This is where true happiness is found. And when you don't find happiness, who's to blame? You. And what does your baptism allow you to say to the accuser that is within your flesh and the great accuser, Satan, when he levels his accusations against you? Because often, what are those ac accusations false or true? They're true. So what happens? What do you say? I've been washed in the spirit. Yeah. Get behind me, Satan. 
Christ has claimed me as his own. And I know what you're saying is true, but guess what he told me? He told me, I know all that about you, and I'm claiming you as my own images. So buzz off. <laughs> There's a, there's a really great hymn in the, the Lutheran service book, the new hymn one. It says, I'm God's own child. I gladly say it. I'm baptized into Christ. Satan, drop your ugly accusation. I am baptized into Christ. Right? So notice it doesn't say drop your ugly accusation. They're not true. It says drop your ugly accusation. I'm baptized into Christ. So by being baptized into Christ, all of those things I'm accused of have been fully satisfied. The justice for those have been fully satisfied in the crucified flesh of my Savior Jesus which I've just been baptized into that new perfect life. Right? So we get all the benefits of the sacrifice of Christ without the suffering, pain, and death because of baptism. Pretty cool. And the daily part is really important because it isn't one and done in the sense that you can refer back to it and God's promise that happened then is true today. So why do you need through daily contrition and repentance need to relive your baptism. Did it not, did the promise not take? But we continue to sin, right? Because the promise, the person who's the object of the promise, us, has, no, we, well, we have come back, but there's always a part of us in the world that's trying to draw us away from that promise to get us to stop believing. Oh, baptism is an amazing thing, but for you, it's not for you. Look at what you did. And so if you ever in any way turn baptism into a work of you, it's over. It's done. Because then that accusation comes flying and you have no recourse. Because it was on you and you screwed it up and you're, you're messed up and you're sinful and you did that wrong thing that he's accusing you of. And you can't say, well, Christ claimed me as his own because you're saying, I proclaimed myself for Jesus. I gave him my heart. Which is a horrible gift, by the way. Um, but what do we get to say instead? That he claimed us as his own. That he chose me. Not because of anything I've done. So a lot of those accusations, all you want, Christ has taken them in my place. Okay. So that's why baptism is such a big deal to us. You had a all question. believers are extremely offended by hearing that. Too. What, that they're not good people? No, no, they're, they're, really, they're really offended by hearing, you know, I've been saved by Christ. You know, through, through yeah, death, where they be offended. Well, because they think it's an excuse for all of your bad actions. Right. Well, that's that's, a, that's convenient. Yeah. Actually, it's really not. If you have, if you're a person of faith, that means that you're genuinely disappointing Jesus, right, all the time. So, like, real aggressive, complete grace and mercy for a sinful person is a, is not only is it mysterious and hard to understand. But it is a sort of cross to bear in and of itself because you're always wondering what's the catch. Like, you shouldn't do this for me. Like, have you ever done something really nice for somebody that's sort of like, it's not a response to something they've done? You just wanted to help them. It's above and beyond. What's the response usually? What's the catch? Don't do that. Don't do that. Because what are they afraid is going to happen? Yeah. Well, and, and they're not they, now notice they'll they, like they're afraid they're gonna have to do something. Not because you asked them, but because what is going to happen to them? Get, well, who's gonna cause the guilt? Their own conscience. Right? Strong believers the won't feel that way in general. Ah, right. Well, this is something that I uh, just practically speaking, a good example in church is. If you have a youth group and the youth group wants to help out at somebody's house because they're elderly and they have trouble doing the things they used to be able to do, if you do not let them, it is you not having faith in the body of Christ. It is you and your stubbornness and pride clinging to your own ability to live as you wish and the little hope to you and not relying on the things that God has placed around you. Right? Um, now, often that side of things isn't really discussed because the church has been so obsessed with young people. They forget about all people. Well, they're, they're not growing the church, they're not the future of the church. Of course, they're the future of the church. The church is eternal. Um, anyways, sorry. Okay, so daily contrition repentance. So you're baptized, it's not a one and done deal when it comes to it's a one and done deal when it comes to justification in the eyes of God because He pronounces you are justified, you are His. But it's not one and done in the sense of the sanctified life of a Christian, right? And 
And so Luther describes it as the daily dying to the old self, the daily rising of the new. Now, before baptism, there wasn't even a fight. Because there was nothing to oppose the old Adam. So in baptism, you receive the new spirit of God. So there's a fight going on within you. Right? That's what, this is what Paul talked about. He said, I wouldn't have even known what it was to come until the law told me something was. Right? And then the law produced sin within me, and then I died. So I'm, when the new spirit of God comes to live within you, its its job partially is to kick the old spirit out, right? And that's the war that's waging on inside of you until Christ returns to make all things new. And so the, your the daily remembrance of your baptism. So I've even heard it suggested that um, and and do this this week every day this week. Okay, here's my challenge to you this week. Last week was to invite somebody to Bible study. This week is the first thing you say when you wake up in the morning each day this week. Say, I am baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Jesus. Just remember your baptism. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning. And don't tell me you don't have time. That literally takes like three seconds. Okay? And you don't even have to say it. I would encourage you to say it out loud. Because the gospel is a physical thing. Okay? Um, so, when you wake up in the morning, what are you going to say? Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No. Right? So do that every day as well. Yeah. I've heard that Satan doesn't know what we're saying. He only hears us when we speak audible. Is that true? I mean, in a sense, there would be some credence to that because he's not an omniscient being. Uh, so he's a fallen angel. So God can hear your thoughts and know your heart, but he can't. Um, and there is power in speaking the words of God. So um, this was something I think maybe we covered last week. I don't know. I can't remember if I did this in confirmation here. But um, is the word being spoken, the gospel word being spoken, is that a spiritual thing or a physical thing? Um, it's both, right? Because when I say words, what happens? How do you hear them? It's just magic. <laughs> Sound waves. And what do the sound waves hit? Your eardrums, right? So the words of the gospel are a physical touch to your ears. That's why in the scriptures, when it says the person who isn't here, like they, their ears don't work, is what they're saying. Right? Or they've stopped them up or closed them up. Right? Um, so when you say your devotions, when you say your prayers at home, I would encourage you to say them out loud. Right? Not only for the witness of your own children, if you have children living in home, but also for protection against the spiritual warfare that's going on internally and externally in your life. Right? Most people thought Luther was crazy because he talked out loud to God. And he, he also talked out loud to the devil. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you have to go and reenact a scene from The Exorcist in your <laughs> living room. Okay? But what I am saying is, like, speak the words of God out loud in your home. It makes a difference. Right? I, and if you want, I have a, I have a right that is a house blessing, and I'll go into every room of your house, and I'll speak the words of God in your home to bless your home. So if you want to do that, just let me know. I would also add to that um, it's very beneficial for husband and wife. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because who else doesn't know the inner monologue of your heart and mind? Other human beings. Right? So what you do publicly and vocally makes a difference. Um, and it's for their benefit, right? Okay. Um, so we have daily contrition and repentance, drown and die, all sins and evil desires. And then a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever, right? So this is pretty consistent with the way that the scriptures talk about how we should treat the word itself. What does it say we should do with the word? Read it once and then leave it Closed in a closet somewhere yeah. in your house? No. no. Daily. 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 Right? The one thing, if you've ever had the privilege of listening to somebody who grew up in a, in a country or culture that was hostile to Christianity, what is the thing that they go after? They go after the Bible. They make it illegal to have one, make it illegal to own one, make it illegal to produce them, and give them to other people. Okay? And so the word is the source 
started, right? Christ, the word made flesh, okay? And the passing of that word on through the work of the Holy Spirit. So read it out loud. Be in your word. Pray out loud. So this week, your challenge, right? Say, I'm baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Until somewhat recently, we had a member who was born and raised in uh, East Germany. Uh, and he was there, you know, when the wall came down, he had been upper teens or maybe 20. And he has some interesting stories. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard uh, from a, a Ukrainian Lutheran pastor who, in his youth, that was the USSR, where we were not allowed to have a Bible, we were allowed to speak the words of the Bible publicly. And he talked about how, whenever he went to see his grandmother, his grandmother had hidden a copy of the Bible in the attic, in a box in the attic. And he would go up into the attic and using the light of a candle, write down a couple of verses every time he went to the to his grandmother's house so that he could he could internalize God's word. Okay. Um, and then I, the whole time I'm thinking, <laughs> I listen to that guy's like, I've got seven Bibles at home and I haven't opened them in like last week. Okay. So this daily focus on God's word is part of the context of the daily dying to self and rising to new life in Christ. That is what is going on in your baptism. Right? And so our justification and sanctification are the two different phases of the disciple of Jesus. Baptism is both. It's a pronouncement of justification from God. He's faithful. He will surely do it. It's been fully accomplished. You are a child of God. But he hasn't freed you for nothing. Right? He hasn't called you to nothing. So in the sanctified life, you have this daily exercise. Because until Christ comes again, you have this pesky thing inside you, your sinful flesh, that's going to try to get you to doubt the faith and the promises you've been, been given and to draw you away from Jesus. Because after the events of this week, what happened to this world in the womb of this week? Yeah, he's done. He lost already. Okay. So if you're clinging to Christ and the promises that he's given you, he can't do anything. So his number one goal, and the number one goal of your sinful flesh, which clings lovingly to this world, is to get you away from those promises, to get you to doubt those promises. And baptism is meant to be a gift given through the church, that something tangible that you can hold on to when you're enduring those assaults from the devil and your own sinful flesh. Okay, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. You read one of the verses there from verse 4, but we're going to read a few of the others. And somebody, before we leave, remind me that we need to pick our next Bible reading. Just so I don't forget. Yeah, we, we, were, we were Christian superstars. We read a whole book of the Bible in one week. Pretty incredible. Better John. I'm on to you now. <laughs> All right, somebody got Romans six. They want to read it for us. What Go shall ahead. we? Yeah. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us? Who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. 
Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from life or from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Okay. So. So what is happening here in Romans 6 that Luther highlights is this connection to the regenerated new life you have in Jesus and the daily spiritual warfare because of that that you now endure. Because the devil doesn't, doesn't really care about people who are still dead in their trespasses. Because what can dead people do? Nothing. They're not fighting against him. Right? Um, and so Christ dies. And you are now united to that death in mysterious ways. Okay, so let's look at Christ's death. What does Christ's death do? After all, we're, we're here on the cusp of Holy Week, just entered into the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus has just told us all of what He's going to do. So, what is what does Christ's death accomplish? Forgiveness of sins. How did it accomplish the forgiveness of sins? Yeah, the price for the sins have been paid, right? Um, so, like, it isn't that the debt wasn't paid, it's just not, you don't have to pay it. Right? Your sins have been forgiven because another have taken them. What else happens with Christ's death? All right. So this is a pretty poor deal for Jesus, but uh, he takes all of our sin. And what does he give us in return? His perfect righteousness. That's why I wanted to wear the robe today in church, because the white robe that the pastor wears is actually not to draw attention to the person who occupies the office, but the office itself by representing that I'm clothed, right? I'm a sinner, like everybody else, my black clothes. But my black clothes have been clothed in the white perfect robe of Christ's righteousness, okay? All right, so we have forgiveness of sins and righteousness. What else happens? Made right with God. Dave or Cooper, did you have something else? Um, our old self was crucified with him. Okay, old self is crucified. Not yet. So all of these things we listed, and this pretty much covers all the main parts. Did you have one? Okay, yeah. So this so that kind of goes with the forgiveness of sins. Uh, no sting of death. Because what are the wages of sin? Death. Right? Um, so that death has been paid, right? So if we took all that together, the theological term for Christ's death and all the stuff that it accomplished is called objective justification, right? So it's an objective event I can describe to you, and, and I can even tell you that who is it for? The whole world, right? So because of what Jesus did on the cross in Jerusalem all those years ago, the whole world's sins have been forgiven, the sting of death has been removed. He's exchanged his perfect righteousness and made humanity right with God. But what do you still not yet know? What the heck does that have to do with you? How are you connected to Jesus dying on the cross all those years ago? How do we find that out? Through the word. Where do you hear the word? The church, who started the church? Jesus did. And what did he give the church? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, baptism, mm -hmm. communion. Right? What do we call those in Lutheran terms? Means of grace, right? So the whole point of these means, one of which we're talking about right now, baptism, is to take the great big salvation event of Jesus dying on the cross. And making sure you know that it is for you. So, subjective? Yes. 
So then it becomes subjective justification, not in that it's like the truth of it is malleable, but then it's applied to a subject. Why do you? So in baptism, it isn't the whole world that's getting water and work dribbled on their head or dumped. Who is it? You. That's why people bear witness to you about your baptism. That's why you need to remember your baptism, because it's one of the connections between these two things. And there's nothing we've done that's made us deserve it. Right. That's why, that's why it has to remain a means of God's grace, not of my own. Right. And then uh, again, in communion, when the pastor gives you the body and blood of Jesus, what does he say to you? Or the elder. He said, this is the body and blood of Jesus. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago for the salvation of the whole world. You don't say that? What do we say? For you. For the forgiveness of your sin, right? So take eight. This is the body of blood. This is the body of Christ given for you, right? And Luther emphasizes that as well. So baptism is in that same vein. All right. So we, we already discussed the second part of this question here. Is baptism something that finishes at the end of the rite in the church service? And the answer, of course, to that is... No, right? It's a daily thing. It's a daily struggle, right? Before you were dead, there was no fight. In baptism, you were given the spirit of God, and you are welcomed into the family of Christ. So now there's a battle going on. Because you're not dead anymore, you're alive in Jesus, right? And the baptism points you to the victory that's been won, which sustains you in the midst of the final throes of this battle, right? Because the old Adam has lost, right? The world has been judged. All that good stuff that we, we heard in the gospel reading today, right? He's going to try and convince you that he's not lost, that it's not over, okay? But that's why your baptism is not just some extraneous event that happens to you. It points you to the victory that has been won. And now it's saying to you, this victory is yours. All right, number five is about what has God created in holy baptism? So somebody will look up 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Janine's got that one. Somebody will look up Ephesians 4, 22 to 20. Everybody jump at once. <laughs> Laura. Yep, go ahead. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, she is a new creation. The old has passed away. The old and new has come. All right. So this is what we believe is happening in baptism, that it literally makes a new being, a new creation, a new creation. Right? What is one of the ways that Jesus, resurrected Jesus is described? He is the first fruits of the new creation. Right? By first fruits, we mean he's the, he's the one leading the charge, but there's more coming after, right? In the gospel reading today, he said that if the seed goes into the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. Right? So this new creation is that fruit, right? So in the catechism here on page 303, it says the new man refers to us as restored creatures of God and Christ. We have been united with Christ by the washing of rebirth, which results in new spirit-created attitudes, desires, or actions. Right? But think about that for a moment, right? Before you receive the Spirit of God, none of the Christian things that are described as good are done. And even if you do something that seems righteous, you're not doing it to glorify God or in pure service to a neighbor. You can't do that. You don't have the Spirit of God. Right? Many people do all kinds of seemingly nice things, but they do that so other people will like them. Let them be well regarded. Right? There's all kinds of those are all motivations of the old act, right? Who until this washing and new birth occurs, he's in charge. Right? He's the one calling the shots. In there. Okay, the next one, uh, Ephesians 4. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness. All right, thank you. So, 
how do we put on <coughs> the new app? Huh? We don't. Spirit in us puts on the new app. Okay. By fighting with our old app. How does he fight the old app? By the internal struggle. Spirit comes in against us. Well, how does that happen? Putting on Christ. Putting on Christ or sanctification with the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? How does putting on Christ happen? How does sanctification happen? What does the Holy Spirit draw you to? What did you say? Through baptism. Through baptism, what does baptism draw you to? Where is he found? <clears throat> yeah, word and sacrament. Right? <clears throat> when you engage in, when you read the Bible at home, you're engaging in the spiritual warfare against your old sinful flesh. When you come to church on Sunday, you're engaging in the warfare against your old spiritual flesh, your old sinful flesh. Right? Because what happens if this gets settled? What happens to you? You're done. Right? So how does Christ keep you connected to himself? To the church. To the gifts that he's given the church. Right? Worship has become this weird thing that we think we do. We do not do worship. Worship is done, is, is done as God giving us things. And then we sing our praises back for the thing that's been received. So if you go to a church and all that they do is sing and pray, that's a very weird interaction because nothing's been done to them worth singing and praying about. That's why our service is organized the way it is, right? We receive the forgiveness of sins. We return to him our worship and praise. We receive the instruction and wisdom of God from his word and the Holy Spirit. We return to him our worship and praise. We come before the table, receive the body and blood of Jesus, and return to him for worship and praise. Without the word of God in the service, there is no joy to be had. Right? So all of these things are to remain keeping us connected to Christ in this daily battle with the old sinful flesh. Right? Now, you can take that too far, and that's where you get into pietism. Right? We're not talking about pietism, but we're talking about like the weapons that you've been given. The Spirit urges you to go to those and use them. Right? So when you're reading the Bible, when you're saying prayers, when you're reminding yourself of baptism by saying in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is all the Spirit driving you to remain connected to Christ, to cling to Him. Right? That's how He, that's, <clears throat> that's what Jesus meant when He said, when I'm going to be raised up, what am I going to do to all people? I'm going to draw them to Myself. That's how he does it. Right? He didn't put a giant magnet on the back of the cross or something like that. He started the church, gave the church his gifts, and gave us a means by which the church can deliver those gifts to you in order for the life of sanctification to remain, for you to remain justified and to live according to his precepts. Right? Okay. Any final questions about baptism? This sort of concludes our section on baptism. Next week, or two weeks from now, we're going to be starting communion. We're going to continue with our understanding of this on the music grace. So any other questions about baptism? Yep. Oh, yeah. If it's more of a comment, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so well, I, what are you going to say? <laughs> so in, uh, in Romans 6, I really like uh, verse 13. That's, you know, when we talk about the sort of passive or active nature, right? I think that's always uh, difficult to articulate. But here he says, do not present your members to sin, uh, but present yourselves to God. And I think that's an interesting verbiage there, right? Because it's like, well, we, we can't really stop ourselves from sinning, but it's like positionally, where are we, right? Where are we putting ourselves? I mean, physically, it could be presenting ourselves in, in the church, right? On, in service, presenting ourselves for baptism if we're adults or, or the parents on their behalf. Um, you know, we can make choices about where we are, and like certain situations are certainly uh, better uh, than others. Well, and, and I think the so the weird the weird Lutheran position on all of that because we're not Arminian, so we don't believe it's our will both directions. Our will is only in the rejecting part, in the in the choosing to go away. It's the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus the other direction, right? So if you end up getting baptized. 
If you're a baby, it's because you have God-fearing parents and they brought you, as is their right from the Lord to do so. If you do it as an adult, it's because you've been drawn by the faith and the promises of baptism, which is not your work, but the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so and that, that's an important distinction to make because those positions then become really important insofar as they are works of God drawing you to him. And you can trust in that rather than in your own act of choice and will. Because it's the same with baptism, right? As soon as you turn, as soon as you turn baptism into your work of faithfulness, all of the joy and assurance that the gospel that is supposed to be presented there disappears. Right? It's no longer something you can refer to and say, God chose me because you're saying that you chose God. In that, in that age, right? um, but I think the proximity point is great. Right? The proximity point is great. Um, and that language is, I think, intentional on, on behalf of Paul, right? Present yourselves to God is the antithesis of presenting your members as a sin, as instruments of sin. And often, I think we say that the opposite of that would be, well, to do good things. He says, no, it's the opposite of that is present yourselves to God, and then what follows after that is the good stuff. Right? Um, yeah, very good. Okay, so before we close, we need to pick our biblical literacy reading. Now, we have two weeks to do it. I was sort of thinking, hear me out here and then we'll we can have at it. Um, I was sort of thinking what we should do is read the Passion Account of Jesus from the Gospel of John. Since that's going to be the focus of Holy Week, um, we're going to be, I'm going to be preaching the series I'm preaching on is from the, the Gospel of John. So it will enrich your experience of the sermons as well, particularly here at Ascension. But it would just be good anyways. Start, so I think it's John 12 through 20. Yeah. Well, let's just go ahead and read to the end as it just goes to chapter 21. So we'll do John 12 and 21 if that's okay with you guys. Um, and you got two weeks to do it, okay? Because uh, we aren't having class next Sunday since it's Easter. We're going to be down here stuffing our faces with all the delicious food that I'm going to bring up. Um, but John 12 through 21. And I would encourage you, uh, this isn't required, of course, because I can't require anything, but um, I would encourage you to read it multiple times. So I had a really powerful scripture reading experience in seminary when I took a, a, a class on the Gospel of Matthew from uh, Jeff Gibbs, who wrote the commentary. For our synod on the book of Matthew, and he required us to read the whole book of Matthew every week of the class, and it was a really cool experience, because I'll just be honest with you, seminary students don't meditate on the word day and night either, okay? <laughs> we struggle with that just like everybody else, yeah. um, so I would encourage you, not necessarily you want to read them all every day, but read it multiple times, if you want to read it every day, go for it. Okay. But read it multiple times. I think you'll get a lot out of that. Okay. What chapter? John, John chapter 12 through 21. Through the end of the book. All those chapters. 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 <laughs> we've, been doing, we've been doing 10 chapters. So that's <laughs> nice. so. You got, you got two weeks. Oh, no. That was Jude. That was Jude. Yeah. Whoa. I don't know if you were thinking about it on page 305, but that's really, really apropos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so if you got your catechism to the closing prayer, we'll do the prayer from page 305. Uh, if you don't have it, don't worry about it. We'll just listen. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have forgiven our sins, rescued us from death and the devil, and given us eternal life by baptism into the death and resurrection of your beloved Son. Strengthen our faith so that we daily put to death all sins and evil desires, and trusting your sure promises are raised to live before you in righteousness and purity. Finally, bring us to the fulfillment of our baptism and the resurrection of the body to life everlasting through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. If you're sticking around here for Easter, I'll see you Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. If not, have a blessed time with family and safe travel. And I'll see you back pretty every week.